Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we're just going to give it a couple more minutes before we get started. We're waiting on a couple more people to hop on. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Vincic. I'm the general manager at Securematics. I hope you're all doing well today. We're very excited to bring you this Fast Track series this morning. Um, and what I'd like to do first is, uh, Bailey, if you could switch to the first slide. Thank you. So I want to briefly go over the agenda here. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about Securematics. We've been in business about 20 years. I've been with the company for about 12 and a half, um, and we're a distributor here in San Diego. We really specialize around Juniper Mist uh, products and solutions, as well as we carry uh, Sonicol, Pulse Secure, and also Ruckus Wireless. Um, and there's a purpose why we do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We feel like there's some best in class products and solutions here. We'd like to go very deep on the networking, security, wireless uh, space. Uh, and uh, we've been successful doing so. It's all because of partners like you on the uh, webinar today, as well as some customers I think we have. I think we had a total of about 81 registrants. So we're really happy that you're here. Um, the other thing about us you should know is that we're really a an agile company. We like doing, uh, well, pre-COVID stage, we like really doing business uh, person to person, if you will. Uh, prior to uh, doing these webinars, uh, we used to do this in, in, in our office in San Diego. It was a really easy sell, especially around January, February, to get folks to come in uh, because we're in a good spot and a good location. And, and that's the way we prefer to do business. But right now we have to do it via uh, Zoom or, or uh, go to meeting or something else, right? Um, so um, the other thing is, is that our differentiation, I believe, really is our culture. Uh, we, we enjoy the uh, relationships. We don't want you to call us and get a machine. We want you to get a person. And we want to really uh, mold our solutions around your needs, uh, whether it's customer service or credit, uh, financing, anything that you need, we'd like to more customize to the way your customer is doing business. So with that, what I wanted to do is I, I have Sam Fidala here. He's a, a consultant who is working on COVID, uh, what we call COVID response solutions. So Sam, welcome. Um, one of the things that we're gonna do today is we're gonna have more of a conversation. Just so we don't just slide whip you, we wanna make sure that we uh, you know, having a conversation uh, between us all, all the panelists here. We also have um, Nick Cornwell from Pop ID. Um, and today, like it says on the agenda, we're really going to focus up around the first mile of the journey. And as you'll see, um, it's really around all about kiosks. And what, Sam, you know, why don't you talk a little bit about um, maybe the journey, the first mile here in your mind. I mean, partition it up for us a little bit. Sure, yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. And, and also I'd like to thank everybody for giving, a, giving, us, giving you a little bit of, giving us a little bit of your time today. Um, but yeah, so as Brian mentioned, I mean, our, our goal here is really to get folks back to work 
or school safely um, and create some peace of mind. And uh, the approach we took to accomplish this, we're calling the first journey. And you might ask yourself, well, what is this journey? So from our perspective, uh, this journey is from a, per you, you know, a person's home to work. And then once at work, uh, once they get inside the building or their, or their workspace, and from our perspective, it needs to be simple, it needs to be compliant and secure. And, you know, just a few little topics um, on the journey. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we really wanted to come up with the best of breed technologies. And these range for everything from IoT devices, biometric, uh, biometrics, Bluetooth, wireless solutions. And we wanted to combine all of this with artificial intelligence and then ultimately create uh, some type of analytics uh, dashboard where you can actually see what's going on in your environment. Um, so as we talked about, you know, today is just about the first part of the journey and we call this the first mile. So a few things that, uh, in, that, that are included with the first mile are questionnaires, wearable devices, and like Brian said again, kiosks. So uh, let's see here. Brian, did you, or you want to go to? Well, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about, you know, our personal journey at Securematics. I mean, it's kind of twofold, right? One is, is that uh, the first thing we had to do back in March is make a call to shut down the office early. And then from that part of the journey, what we had to do is make sure everyone could, you know, was safe and could work from home. Uh, and that involved, like I said in the past, um, equipment, firewalls, all sorts of things, even even hotspots, because we had some employees who couldn't really get a reliable internet access from home. So we we actually put together our earthquake disaster plan and turned it into a pandemic disaster plan in the very beginning. Um, but then from there, we decided that at some point we'd like to open the office because it's really part of our culture to have day-to-day -day interaction and just a synergy between the employees. So what we're going to do today is we're going to really reflect, and, and not the entire journey today, but we're going to really reflect on what we've done as a company. And, um, and so you'll see a little bit later on in the presentation that we're going to go through some of the steps that we took. And, and we've gone through a lot of uh, trial and error on this. I would say this is uh, a journey that's evolving. It has to do a lot with, you know, the technology space and the non-technology space. Example of that is, you know, there's technology components that we want to put in there right away. And one of them was a kiosk. Um, we quickly partnered with Pop ID to do that. And you're going to find out that every kiosk is not made, you know, alike. Um, and um, there's all sorts of issues we had to answer around, you know, how do we register people? How do we uh, make sure that the data privacy was in place? And, and so that's, that was a key part for us. And also really the physical layout uh, of the office, signage, any regulatory things we had to really pay attention to. So, so Sam, um, when it comes to that, um, any kind of key findings in that first part, you know, when we're going through the, the, the kiosk part of it? And, and maybe, Bailey, you could flip to the next slide while we talk about this. Um, any, any general observations there? Sure, sure. So, so as we were going, you know, talking to people and trying to understand not only what they were trying to accomplish or uh, you know, how they were trying to make their environment safe for employees or students to possibly come back. But, you know, what's what's the CDC saying? What type of regulatory compliance issues are coming down from the state or even local level? And and then, you know, especially in, in the educational world or schools, parents are concerned about children's pictures being taken on these kiosks and you know, where, how's that stored? Is is their data stored on the device itself? And, and is, is that a potential risk? So we were just getting a whole lot of feedback and, and just concern that how can we use this, this great health screening device and still answer all of these questions around, 
HIPAA, data privacy, and basically basic overall security. Okay, that's good, Sam. I appreciate it. And you know, again, as someone responsible for a company, the first thing I wanted to make sure was that all the employees stay safe, they're healthy, and we do everything we can to empower them uh, to do so. So when we're coming back to the office, the obvious thing, Sam, was is that we talked about, gee, how do we just get them responsibly in the door, right? That uh, there's a number of ways you could do it. First suggestion was is that we stand there with a handheld thermometer and we take everyone's temperature and we stagger folks arriving at work uh, to do so. Now, you know, what what do you think are some of the issues around that, Sam? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great point. So what we quickly learned is, first of all, having an employee stand there with a, a, a thermometer actually puts the employee at risk, which could potentially create yeah. some liability for the company. So so that wasn't a really a great answer. Um, not to mention, you know, the employee could certainly be better used actually doing something else other than taking a temperature. Um, so yeah, it just it, it just didn't seem practical or or really even safe for, for from our perspective. So uh, that's really where it pushed us to, to to look at the temperature sensing kiosks. Yeah, one of the other things we discovered is is that um, how do you log who's who's come into the office and at what time and if somebody does arrive with the temperature, is there anybody who was in close proximity? And again, some of these solutions sound daunting, but you'd be surprised how just through analytics, you can get this data readily available. So that was another key thing we looked at is how can we log that? Uh, how in some cases can we replace a time clock if we needed to? Um, and, um, and then how can we react to uh, something where uh, you know, for instance, we had an employee show up, which we thought had a temperature. Um, the employee walked into the kiosk, and then once they were flagged having a temperature, we were alerted immediately via text. And you could set up these rules ahead of time that, you know, this person had a temperature, and we were able to, you know, have a process in place so that employee steps outside and then we can manually check if we need to to find out if it was a false reading or not uh, and um, we felt like we we're acting very responsible there but even before we get to the office sam um, there's things that we could do right uh, before you even get you know in the car uh to or, yeah. or right absolutely what? so so there's there's a lot of things that can be done before even leaving the house. And that's why our journey really starts at home. And it seems like one of the more common uh, or at least sensible from our perspective things to do is just simply answer a questionnaire. Well, you know, this could be a real manual process, um, mm -hmm. but it, they're, they're, I think the better answer is there's applications that you can put on your, your smartphone. And of course, you, you know, your organization can come up with these answers and a little later on today, we'll give you a couple of examples of what what type of questions you might want to ask on these things. And you know, you can you can do maybe a temperature reading or some type of self assessment at home, and at least uh, take that first precautionary step before even leaving home. You know, if you don't feel good or your your uh, child doesn't feel good, you can go ahead and go through that process and, and deal with it before you ever even try to go to work. So that might be a great preemptive step. Yeah. And uh, so thanks, Sam. Also, I'm noticing that I'm Mitch Wade and I'm Brian Vincent. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to give you the credit, Mitch. Um, and, and I'm not sure I could change that right now, but I wanted to clarify that. Thanks for that heads up, Mitch. Um, today I get to be you. I'm uh, uh, anyway. No comment. So, um, you know, based on based on that, since we're kind of technologists, obviously, we're in the industry. One of the things, Sam, that we wanted to do was to figure out, is there really a good way to do these at home checks and, and also incorporate them in our wellness programs at work? Right. We're always looking for ways to 
uh, make sure that employees could be proactive around their health and, and do it in a private setting. So one of the things that we did is we went out, we were searching for solutions and, and, and primarily, uh, obviously around temperature checking. So we went and, and said, oh, of course our Apple Watch must have temperature checking on it or our Samsung Watch or Fitbit or Garmin and nothing really did, Sam, right? I mean, there's nothing Not that much. we found. No. And, and so we ended up with this thing called an Aura Ring. Now, it, it is a literally a ring you wear. Okay, I don't know how, maybe I can do the background here. It's almost like a wedding band. And, and what happens is, is that this ring, and again, sorry for the low tech uh, uh, demonstration here. I don't know if I could do this. This ring actually, there's an app associated with it. And it gives you all these vitals um, where, where basically it says, um, you know, what your resting heart rate look like. Um, again, sorry for the low tech. Um, and, and temperature, uh, it actually goes through and, and looks at body temperature. Now I'm kind of review, I'm kind of being unhip or uh, compliant here by sharing my data. But as you can see, a couple of days ago, I was getting a warning that my temperature, my rests were kind of out of whack a little bit, just a little bit abnormal. And then lo and behold, three days ago, I spiked a little, whoop, here we go. I spiked a little bit of a fever. Now, that's pretty awesome. And I'll tell you, back in, back in, uh, back in May, for full disclosure, when I first received this ring, um, I don't know if you could see that real well, but I, I got a similar warning. And then all of a sudden, my temperature spiked to over 104 degrees. So this stuff actually could work. I mean, it's better than nothing. I mean, there's some leading indicators. So we're guiding employees to say, if you have one of these and you're completely self-monitoring, right, Sam? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a device that we don't look at the data, we don't look at the app, but we use it as a guideline to say, you know, check out what your ring may be saying. And if you feel like you're not rested or your temperature is getting elevated, that you may just continue to continue to work from home. So we found that a very useful tool and we've incorporated that into a questionnaire as well. Right, Sam? Exactly. And one interesting side note, it's really up to your organization on what you wanna do because if you have a questionnaire app, you can actually have it generate a, a QR code. And then you, at, when the employee shows up to check in, um, they can actually use that on the kiosk as a kind of a secondary check-in if you want, if you wanted to do that. So it can get a little, you can, you can add a, a few layers if you, if you like. So. Yeah. And the, the interesting part about these uh, solutions and technology is that they are evolving. It's almost analogous to, you know, vi uh, to vaccine development. Right. Uh, we're learning every day and you'll, you'll also hear from Nick, from Pop ID, one of the kiosk manufacturers, that as uh, this whole uh, area has been evolving, they're learning things as well. For instance, one of the things that the kiosk used to have on it was a questionnaire, and you would actually, you know, select on the kiosk. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, did you were you exposed to anyone with COVID nineteen over the last week? Things like that, and they actually changed the application to recognize hand gestures because people did not want to touch the kiosk. So it could be, uh, you know, a simple no or yes on the kiosk, just displaying your hand gesture will answer the question. So pretty, pretty exciting how things are evolving. So again, we've talked about a little in general about some of the at home prep. The idea is to really empower uh, the employee to get the best data they can uh, with with all the privacy intact uh, to make a decision to come to work and 
and some questionnaires so that they'll they'll you know will jog their memory on what to what to really watch out for and that questionnaire could change quite a bit depending on on where we're at um we even have people driving from different counties and different counties have different regulations so we could customize those and then um at some point uh here in the very near future uh within the matter of a couple of weeks we're going to talk about once you get people on prem what do you do okay and and that's going to be you know where we get really deep into the mist juniper applications and solutions and premium analytics and some really exciting things going on there as well but um sam i think you wanted to talk a little bit about this internet of behaviors and right. next slide next slide please here we go so, so tell us a little bit about is, that right so this is really kind of interesting so i think most folks have heard of internet of things or iot and over the last year or so, there's been a new, a new three-letter acronym, IOB, Internet of Behaviors. And what's really interesting about this is it started off as, you know, how do you leverage technology to create a better customer experience or, you, you know, um, a specific uh, value, or value add, if you want to put it that way, to the technology that you already have in place. And, you know, the interesting thing, this is exactly where these types of solutions live. Um, from our journey, you know, the first mile to on-prem to, which consists of, of health screening, um, contact tracing and congestion monitoring, all of these things are components and they all, they need wireless, they need Bluetooth, they need uh, the, the temperature sensing kiosk, all of these devices actually are part of this internet of behaviors space so i thought it was interesting that as we put these solutions together it just fit perfectly in this category and here's just an, a, kind of a little infographic of what i'm talking about you've got your administration or your dashboard so that you can manage this this, this set solution set you've got the self-assessment which we already discussed you get to the front door that's where you do your health screening with the kiosk and as Brian mentioned in, a, in a, another session, we'll go in more depth on contact tracing, which is once you're inside your space and then congestion monitoring so that you can make sure there's not too many people in one, one particular location at a time. And then of course, the all important reporting and, and, and that's really gonna be what is gonna, what you can use for tying into your HR systems and, and actually protecting yourself from you, you know, saying, hey, I've done my due diligence, here's my, proof yeah no it's a very good very good point very good point and by the way this whole um scheme seems very daunting uh and and i remember sam when we when we first met at the office to kind of go through this and we met with keegan and anon you know our technical experts and folks from juniper uh missed uh it, it was a little bit daunting and a, a little bit uh you know a little confusing to put it together but what we really discovered was that once we had the basic template down how simple it all really is and a lot of it is based on this juniper mist engine really is right when, especially when you look at the contact tracing proximity tracing i think we were trying to make it more complicated than it was and and what we found out that it's much easier much more flexible and that when you look at Juniper Mist, especially how they've really had a lot of these pieces figured out. Now you may say, why did they have all these pieces figured out? COVID is relatively new. Well, it's because they've been doing this for other parts of the industry, um, you know, when it comes to either physical security or when it comes to hoteling, you know, and how do you, convention centers, you know, it, it's very similar. Uh, to to uh, or to repurpose it for COVID was very simple to do, and and so we were we were very fortunate uh, to find that out fairly early on, and that's why we created this series because we really wanted to live this uh, ourselves before we start talking about solutions, right? So 
anyway, with that, let's let's go to the next slide and let's just dive into kiosks. Um, and again, um, the importance of that. I feel like you know, person running a company, be responsible to everyone at the company for their health, safe, self, self, <laughs> health, safety, and well-being. That was easy. Um, that it, that I needed to uh, one more slide back, please. That I needed to make sure that everyone arriving at the office uh, was, uh, you know, pre-checked, so to speak. Um, you, you remember the old days, Sam, where uh, employees would arrive to the office during regular flu season, and and the person would be sitting there at the desk, and you say, you oh, know, gee, Julie, what's it looks like you're not feeling good today. And that person would say, yeah, you know, our whole family's had the flu. And it's like, oh my gosh. All right, now now we got ourselves a, a predicament where the whole office could potentially be exposed to the flu. And then we would watch employee by employee call in sick. Those days are over, right, Sam, I think? Yeah, I, I think so. So a lot of folks continue to bring up the fact, well, what 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 happens when this COVID-19 problem solved and we've got, you know, we've got an antidote or we've got a vaccine or we've got therapeutics, et cetera. And from my perspective, or at least we think that it's probably never going to be okay to show up to the office sick anymore. I mean, we've never, we've always kind of dealt with it and, you know, someone shows up and they work through it and you kind of think, wow, they're tough. Uh, but then, of course, they uh, show up and get everybody else sick. So it's not it's it's not uh, it's not great for anybody. So moving forward, I just think that this is going to be something that companies are just going to want to do in, in the future. So the other thing is, I I think we have a few uh, school districts on the webinar as well, and I wanted to address that. Um, not only keeping my employees safe is my primary concern and duty. It's really, I've got a teenage son who is struggling with the fact that he cannot go back to school. And uh, he's a sophomore this year. I talk about this because it's part of my personal journey and his personal journey. And politics aside, please, I don't wanna make this a political uh, forum by any means, but there is this really just innate need uh, for my son to go back to school. He's, he's like I said, now a sophomore. He got yanked just as he, he was feeling comfortable being a freshman. And, um, and um, I just see the effects, just the uh, lack of social interaction. I see the effects on him, on his schoolwork. There's, there's really, I always say that um, the key to getting kids back to school on a full-time basis is is really do it responsibly and it's so important for their health and well-being their uh, socialization that's part of school right psychology i won't get into that uh but that was a very important part of socializing uh there and um the other bit of it is is that it's key to getting the economy fully open because folks you know are spending a lot of time with their kids at home and and really giving them the discipline, becoming homeschool teachers in a lot of cases. It's not optimal. Let's just agree on that. It's not optimal. So one of the things we're going to do is when we talk through this, we're going to pivot a little bit between the office and school because it's really the same use case. But I'll just give you a personal example before we get into kiosks and why they're so important. So, and why picking a solution is extremely important. And I'll leave names out of it because I don't want to throw anyone under the school bus here. But the bottom line is this, is that my son's school adopted a program where they're going to manually take every student's temperature before they come into school. And that quickly broke down. Uh, unfortunately. What happened was is that they weren't logging anything. Um, in a lot of cases, um, I should say that if a temperature couldn't be accurately read, they'd pass the student on. It was really quite a uh, alarming process. 
So what they did was, is they went with a kiosk, they went with a VAR, not a Securimatics VAR, just to qualify that. Went with a VAR, they came up with a solution, and it basically what they did is they matched yearbook pictures, which they took early over the summer, with key, what they tried to match it with the kiosk, and then what happened was none of the students, there was three minute wait time per student at each kiosk. So that broke down. So they went to a, um, and, and, and Sam, I'll ask you to comment about this. Then they went to a self-assessment process. And I've witnessed this self-assessment process. It sounds great on the surface, but what happens in reality is they're asked a series of questions like you've been exposed to COVID, have you been tested? What's your temperature? And um, so, Sam, what what uh, what's wrong with that process? Right. So, so what we've discovered is that you know, although it's it's, it's a great idea and it, it's a great first step, a lot of folks are running late or they take a temperature at home and they might get two or three or four different temperatures while they're taking it and they just write down a temperature that works so so there's a lot of area for that not really to be very accurate and so the great thing is is really if you have a two-step process the questionnaire and then the actual temperature sensing yeah. kiosk at the front door that temperature sensing kiosk is going to catch someone who might be running late let's just say <laughs> right, right. No, I agree with that. I agree. And I've witnessed it firsthand, and, and embarrassingly so, because what happens in, in that rush to get kids, now maybe it's only my kid, but it seems like it's a very last minute thing to get them in the car, they're half dressed, and then you're trying to take their temperature and, and uh, it, it you don't get the accuracy let me just put it that way that you you really require so what we're suggesting is and and we'll also talk about how the whole kiosk as a bundle comes into play we're really really what we're doing is is we're we're asking or even a school an office could customize this but there should be some kind of pre-check like i said before you can go as extreme as using this little ring to say, uh, you know, has your aura ring uh, indicated that, you know, you, you've got the proper amount of readiness? Just ask that question. You don't have to ask any more detail. Uh, have you been in contact with anyone with COVID? Right, Sam? I mean, you can still ask a series of pre-check questions, but that's not the final mile. So let's let's get into it. I, I really want to start talking about kiosks instead of all these war stories. Uh, even though they're fun to talk about. So why don't we go to the next slide. So we talked about the the value of a pre-check questionnaire. We really feel like that's something, and again, it's really a combination of technical and non-technical solution. You have to write down some of the things that you want to, you know, the, the uh, employee or the student to be asked ahead of time. You want to equip them with certain devices if that's appropriate. Uh, but um, let's get into it. I know we have Nick. Nick, you on from Pop ID? Unmute, Nick, if you're on. No? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. So oh, hey, Nick. All right. I think I had to be unmuted from your end. Oh, on Unima for okay, got it. Yeah, we we have a habit of doing that. So, first of all, Nick, thanks for joining. Um, like I said, Nick is with Pop ID. Uh, we found them to be a really good partner, helping us get you know our solution ready for back to office. Um, and um, you know, why don't we, Nick? Why don't we talk through? I mean, you guys have done you know, office implementations, university implementations. I mean, once you talk through kind of the, the kiosk to be, to begin with, and, and also I'd like you to mention at some point how all kiosks are not created equal, because what we discovered, and I'll leave names out of it, 
we discovered that there's some kiosks that have solutions that are in the cloud and that cloud happens to be hosted in places that the US government frowns on that data being hosted, right? And then there's also kiosks that are born out of the security space that we find are kind of desktop app driven and not really <clears throat> you know, cloud driven and, and they present some challenges too where that data is hosted. So just give us a whole pop ID background and approach and, and then go through some of the kiosks if you will. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about this. Um, you know, first and foremost, you know, it was really a call to duty. You know, we were answering the bell, as a, and that's how we really, you know, see this uh, this journey for us, uh, similar to you, as feeling a sense of responsibility to not only your employees and the folks coming in and out of your office. Um, we answered the call as well, um, and we look at it in terms of how can we be a part of the greater solution so that we don't find ourselves in this situation ever again? And kind of as you spoke to the, the data analytics, you know, being able to find and extrapolate some of that data and then being able to use it, giving our, our entire you know, population, you know, what we like to call actionable information, something that you can do something with. So, you know, our journey began really about four years ago in the biometric space. And uh, we realized a number of different values that were built upon this, but similar, like you uh, mentioned before, you know, nobody was doing uh, temperature screening last year, right? Um, especially not in this, in this context. But given the fact that we are already in this business in some form or fashion, kind of like you spoke to the Juniper uh, story, it was an easy pivot for us to be able to get in front of the market and understand what's, uh, what's needed out there. Um, and I'll speak to a little bit of the simplicity of it. Um, you know, when, when we started to create it, we did the same thing as you. We thought it was extremely complicated and extremely, uh, you know, difficult. However, as we started to go down that road, you know, the simplicity was really the best story as people were really uh, felt a daunting task to be able to mitigate the risk and be able to, you know, um, do all of these things that are now being required by the CDC and different uh, city and county and state and federal, you know, requirements. And so as we, that really is what drove our development um, as we went down that journey is how can we provide a tool to as many people as possible and not be something additional in their, you know, uh, task or, or job uh, scope, but actually be something that was relieving of them of their duty, kind of like you spoke to the person, you know, having to hold the handheld thermometer um, out in front of the, you know, entire line of people now, you know, waiting to get into work to school and things of that nature. And so, you know, we really saw the demand um, was there. Uh, we really tried to be um, cognizant and listen to the market and listen to what was being required and where were the pain points. Um, and so that's what's, you know, got us to this point and it continues to evolve. Um, yeah. Some of our recent, uh, you know, history of, of success and things of that nature has, as you mentioned, you know, really been around, um, you know, schools, universities, uh, large food processing facilities, uh, health and wellness uh, centers such as hospitals, senior living, places where, you know, um, health and, and uh, you know, screening is not something that is really, um, you know, it, it's going to be around for a long time and it's really relevant. But I think to point on to Sam's uh, idea there that it, it will no longer be acceptable to go to school or to work uh, you know, feeling sick or, or having something like this. And so we think that there's, you know, a lot of staying power in, in this idea and this concept, therefore creating the most, you know, um, uh, let's call it universal or, or best program to, to really give people the, the best tool to go out there and um, screen people without having, you know, that, that excuse of, oh, I'm running late and, oh, I really need to be here and things of that nature. You know, that really speaks loudly to all of us. You know, I can relate to the idea of, you know, simply, oh, just write down a temperature, whatever it is, you know, on your kid as you're running out the door to try to be on time. Um, well, that was exactly what we were doing before was 
we knew the kid was sick or we knew the kid wasn't sick and whatever it was, it never stopped anything. We still showed up to school or to work and, and it still went on that way. And it really left the accountability, you know, out, out the window because we got to get to work and the kids got to get to school. And so, you know, we're happy to be a part of this solution and it continues to evolve as the CDC, the FDA, you know, cities, counties, um, markets continue to evolve its understanding as well. So Nick, I mean, it's super critical that we have a, you know, a person going on campus and we, we have a known, a, a fairly known quantity of their condition, right? Um, because of the factors you just mentioned. Uh, it's interesting. I've talked to you know, all sorts of people, you know, you could talk to executives down to hourly workers. And, and when you talk to folks that, you know, are hourly workers, and usually it's both a husband and wife that will work. I mean, getting them to school is so critical um, uh, to to their well-being, right? And and you can't just leave your sixth grader or seventh grader, my kids in tenth grade. It's hard to leave them alone just because they don't have the discipline in some cases, and they're not getting the instruction value that they would get in the past in person. Um, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you know, I walked in the other day, my son's on a virtual reality headset while he's in the middle of a geometry lesson. I, I mean, we're constantly having to patrol, and it says something about us, but we're constantly having to patrol, you know, uh, even in, even when I feel like we had the best of circumstances. Uh, but, um, but anyway, so why don't, why don't we walk through a little bit, uh, next slide. Well, do you want to go over these, these two kiosks that you have here? Absolutely. So um, our first iteration was the standard key out there that you see on the left. Um, and that iteration was has been extremely successful. The simplicity of it, um, very simple to install, uh, requires power and internet. That can be a hard wire or a plug. Uh, it could be Wi-Fi um, or either Ethernet. Um, so very simple, very to, uh, you know, to install, get up and running and off the ground. The next iteration that we call the Pro is really a, a an answer to um, the idea, and this is really around centered around the healthcare uh, facilities. We actually have the ability through our biometrics to actually find and locate specific points to target for an accurate temperature screening. And so, to you know, answer the bell there for all of us as. You know, I've gone to restaurants and we've all been to different locations where they do a screening on somebody and who knows where they're pointing that uh, that handheld thermometer at, right? It could be at my hairline, it could be at my chest, because quite frankly, they don't want to really know the answer or they don't really want to know the truth. So they're just haphazardly out there with, uh, uh, you know, a box that they're checking. But, um, but in the healthcare arena, it's obvious that they're very concerned and understand temperature screening well, you know, beyond any of our uh, understanding because that's really their business and their profession. So what we really figured out was the actual corner of your eye where your tear duct is located um, is actually the most consistent and accurate location for a temperature screening. And so to answer your question around not all kiosks or temperature screening are the same, that's that's no more evident than in this exact use case here where we can actually find and locate a specific point on your you know, face to be able to take the most accurate and consistent temperature, um, which is extremely important for all of us to make sure that you know, we are getting uh, a honest response from, from the screening. Um, on top of that, the ability to um, answer the FDA's call that you know we you're not supposed to be screening massive amounts of people at one time um, it is supposed to be a one uh, one to one ratio there and then also you know the FDA is very aware and understands this technology as well is that you know anytime you're using infrared um, cameras and technology that you have a lot of factors such as the sun, such as other you know uh, components that can impact 
any type of thermometer uh, that it's an external thermometer. So even your temperature gun, you know, if the wind blows by the right time, um, you know, as, as everybody knows, you're going to get a, a, a different reading almost every single time. So this actually gives us the ability to eliminate as much of that background interference and static as possible as to really shrink down that target space and really take a good um, uh, accurate reading. So both have applicability in, in a number of different ways. Um, in the more complicated situations, we go with the pro. Um, in the standard you know, uh, use case where we have a controlled background and um, it's a simpler, easier uh, screening, we go with the standard. Okay. All right, Nick, let's pause there for a moment before we get into how it works. Um, Bailey, I know we had some polling questions. And we're probably late on some of them, but I thought we would uh, wake people up with some polling questions. Yep, just give me one minute. So we're, oh, there, there was one, I'm sorry. I saw it pop up. Oh. No pun intended. Where did it go? Oh, okay. Here we go. So probably should ask this from the beginning, but you know, first polling question is, do you think your customers would be interested in these solutions? Yes or no? Very simple. Uh, hopefully, since a lot of folks are on the call, I think we had over 80 people register and um, hopefully that'll, there'll be some interest in that. So if you can answer that, that'd be great. Okay, good. All right. Now, for those folks that say no, just let me um, share one experience. It's anecdotal, but we actually partnered with a VAR who said, because of their demographic, where they're located, that there wasn't really a big interest in this uh, or wearing masks or anything. And I, I get that. I respect that. Uh, but we, we did a seminar, and what we found out was that you know, those, some of those customers were really interested once they heard kind of the solutions and the simplicity and the value add. So just keep that in mind, uh, but I appreciate that. Um, uh, Bailey, what's our next polling question? I'm trying to um, see if we should look at that one as well. Yeah, so this yeah. one here closed on its own. So why don't we have everybody submit and answer one of these into the chat? Okay, which back to the office school apps do you think are needed most? So screening devices, which is the first mile of the journey, uh, contract tracing, wayfinding, um, are really what I call the on-prem portion of it. Security, you remember before COVID, it was really active shooter, making sure that you knew who was on campus and, and how to locate them. Um, and then zone alerts. Zone alerts, I'm assuming everyone is, is that more related to occupancy? Can someone clarify that for me? Yes, that'd be congestion alerting. Congestion alerting, occupancy, too many people in the room at once set by your rules, your rules. Okay. All right. So let's, Let's move on. Uh, we're going to be crammed for time here. So, so let's talk about how it works. The next slide here after kiosks. One more time. Whoops, one more time. Didn't build. Or is it supposed to build? There we go. It's supposed to build. <laughs> okay, so I'm really going to, you know, ask Sam and Nick to kind of weave there. And, and by the way, none of this is rehearsed. You probably figured that out by now uh, because we know this stuff so well that we feel like we could, we could do this without having a heavy re uh, rehearsal here. But um, I want really Sam and Nick to talk through this. Maybe Sam, you could talk about, you know, the sure. first step there. Right. So, uh, the, you know, this, one of the reasons that we really gravitated to pop ID is one of our, as our solution for the kiosk is the simplicity of registration. 
And the great part is in the very first step, the admin or the organization is the one who gets to basically set, you know, what what's the temperature going to be? Um, what's the questions, you know, what kind of questions are needed to be entered and in that, in, in that sort of thing. So you can actually have the administrator send out all these registration links and the user on step two receives an, uh, an actual text. And I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll let you jump in, Nick, and, and explain the rest of it. But yeah, so um, in terms of rolling this out again, you know, trying to figure out what is the easiest, most, you know, uh, smooth, simplest way for folks to be able to register and without putting a huge workload or burden on the administrator to go through and figure out who and what and all that kind of stuff, you know, um, we put the onus back onto the register. This also gives, you know, some feeling uh, or sense of, um, you know, this is an opt-in situation. So when you get the text message, you, it's a hundred percent opt-in, opt-out. So you're not forcing someone to, to do this, or you're not going there to take their picture or extrapolating pictures out of yearbooks, um, things of that nature. So that was very important for us to be able to you know, answer to that. The other idea there, um, once you've taken your own selfie um, and you submit it, you're really, you're done. You, and no matter what kiosk that you have access to or granted through, you can now go to and, and go through a health screen or things of that nature. Um, it's also is to also say that in some circumstances, in some cases, um, you can still allow guests who you don't know who the individual is um, in many cases. So um, you may have a registered identified uh, member or you may have folks that you don't know. However, you still wanna take their temperature or ask them some basic health screening questions. Um, the questions are, again, as uh, Sam mentioned, 100% um, customizable. Um, so the administrator would put together a set of questions that they would be able to manage and be answered through simply a hand gesture, which we think is very important because as you uh, alluded to, Brian, or actually Mitch, um, actually it's back. <laughs> Never mind. You changed your name. I'm back. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so you know, answering the questions without touching the screen, without having to go through that process, but again, was answering to the demand in the marketplace. What, from there, one of our favorite things as well is people who are looking for ways to be able to communicate that, yes, I have gone through this process. And many of you have, may have seen, you know, badges or printed uh, name tags or even wristbands. Um, we've gone to a mode of that we could even destroy, uh, dis, de, deploy um, uh, text notifications in the form of a health badge for that day. So this is nice in open campus situations where, you know, in large schools, large universities, we found, you know, they don't want to put a kiosk or a something, a device at every single building or at every single point. So they created a process of a funnel towards, you know, go to this kiosk, please get your screening. And from there, they would have a simple text message that would say, yes, I did this for the day. Um, and here's, this was my result. So that was very nice to be able to do that. Yeah, so Nick, you know, as a customer, I was really pleasantly surprised of, over, over the simplicity of it. Basically, what happened was is that we acquired three kiosks. Um, we then were given a, a login to the portal, if you will. It's an app on your phone. Um, and simply, I, I should, should have been thought ahead of time and share this. But all we had to do is define who we wanted to give access, their name, their phone number. Um, and then uh, we set some thresholds around uh, temperature that we would accept. And it's a pass fail. We don't say what the temperature is. And then the health questionnaires that Nick just mentioned. Now, once I do that, uh, and it's an extremely simple process. Then there's a SMS message, text message that's pushed to that individual cell phone that Nick said they get to opt in. Okay, once you opt in, what happens is it takes your picture, okay, uh, and then it matches you to the kiosk that you're authorized to access. Now, Nick and Sam, you know, tell me a little bit about, there's a lot of, I know there was a reaction when people said, well, I don't want my selfie to be somewhere in the cloud, uh, which is funny if you're on Facebook or anything else, I guess it's already there. But to talk up a little bit about, you know, 
the selfie and the information that's gathered and how that's secured. Yeah. So um, in that case, you know, once you take that, we'll call it a selfie, but uh, actually what you're creating is uh, a vector file, which is a, a fancy word for a log uh, or an algorithm that is a number of different locations on your face, uh, effectively 160 that um, are the measurement points. And so basically we will t you take that picture and that creates a vector file. Now that vector is what is actually uh, measured or, or compared against when you walk up to the device. So that vector file is encrypted. So it can only be decoded out of our, our, out of our um, device at the location in which you have already been um, opted in. So um, that vector file is stored up in the cloud in AWS, encrypted, uh, in rest, and in motion. So ultimately, there is not a picture of anyone that we're storing um, on uh, anywhere uh, for that matter. So that picture is nothing more than a measurement. Once that measurement is turned into a vector file, it's stored in the cloud. And every time when a registered person walks up to a device, the device will scan through the vector files to compare and then be able to present or know exactly who that person was. So effectively, we, it doesn't matter, did you cut your hair? Did you wear makeup today? Have you shaved? Things of that nature really are not applicable here because it is simply not a picture, it's a, it's a measurement. And so nothing is stored on the local device itself. So for security purposes, there's nothing that can be hacked into or seen by anyone um, or anywhere or anytime. So that is really the most secure way of really truly being able to, you know, manage this. You know, uh, Pop ID also does a Pop Pay uh, version of a similar kind of kiosk, and so we understand where security really is the most important factor here uh, when we're trying to deploy something like this. And so we've taken every measure and every precaution to really create the most secure um, mode of this without having to touch anything or have, you know, things of that nature. We know that your biometrics are actually you um, you know a key card or a key fob or a code or a key that's that's only as good as who actually has that card or that key fob or the code you know for a fact this is indeed this person um, with your with your biometrics turned into a vector file so Nick, yeah, and, oh, I'm sorry yeah yeah, and I just wanted to point out the fact that, and again, this is why we really gravitated towards the Pop ID uh, kiosk solution because they started off in the financial space, so the security aspect was already there, and it and and the fact that it's it's a it's a vector, it's it's an algorithm, the data is encrypted from the, the kiosk up to the cloud and back again, so very very safe solution, but. Uh, Bailey, can you move to the next slide, please? Before we do that, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Um, so the only thing I wanted to mention, and Nick kind of glossed over it a little bit, um, it's really important to understand, like I said in the beginning, when you're evaluating kiosks, where is that kiosk manufacturer coming from? Um, and I don't mean physically. I mean from what industry? So uh, there's folks that are in the security space, physical security space that are rushing into kiosks, repurposing kiosks. And I could tell you there's some minuses to that. I think a lot of it is because they weren't really born in, in the, uh, what I'll call the, the biometric space as much as other solutions. And there's some privacy concerns and data concerns. And what I liked about Pop ID is that they're coming from the payment side of the house where you rely very much on biometrics and privacy and, and all the other compliance things that comes with that. As you can imagine, it's a, it, that's a very complex environment to, uh, to come from or, or to be in versus physical security is really not. Right, Nick? There's a whole bunch of stuff, hurdles that you've got to be able to uh, overcome to be certified in, in the space that Pop ID's in on the financial uh, you know, side of the house. The, the, right? 
Absolutely. Um, and that is a very good point. I, I appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, so from our standpoint, you know, we worked into the biometric space of, of payment and, um, you know, that does present an entire different uh, set of circumstances in terms of security around people's information and people's uh, trust and, and privacy. So, yeah, we take that to the nth degree. Um, that's why that is also what's given us a, a tremendous lead into the market is, as you mentioned, um, we weren't creating this out of uh, a void. This was created years ago, and it's now become what it is now today. Um, so, you know, that's that's given us a tremendous uh, advantage. Okay, thanks, Nick. Sorry, sorry, Sam. Let's move to the next slide, like you suggested. But I really wanted to emphasize that point because it's key. We bought maybe three or four different manufacturers kiosks, and we've had a you know, really use the other ones as boat anchors, right, Sam? And we spent a lot of money on them, but we were ever committed to finding, you know, the right solutions for this environment so we could share it with everyone on the on the webinar today. So um, who would like to walk through this one? Sam, you're on mute. Oh, blue Sam. Oh, no, I, you know, I... Uh... I turned my video off. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yeah, I think my bandwidth is struggling, so I guess you'll you'll have to look at oh. Brian. <laughs> but anyway, no, great point, Brian, and, and you're absolutely right. We took we took uh we took a lot of time in evaluating a number of products, and that's why we gravitated back to to Pop ID for for many reasons, the simplicity and, and the security being top of mind. So um, so really here, you know, we just, this is just another picture of just the super simple process. Uh, you know, in this scenario, we actually have the questionnaire app. It's actually on an app on a mobile phone. You can come up to the kiosk doing the facial recognition. Um, and then in, the, and in this particular scenario, we can actually put that safe pass or QR code onto the mobile phone or a sticker even. You can connect a printer that can, can either uh, spit out a sticker or a wristband um, to show other people around that you've actually passed the uh, this, this part of the health screening process. Yeah, so one of the other things I wanted to point out at some, at some time here was um, going, again, I, I shared our journey going through this, but there was also a, we had to determine a physical location, right, Nick, for for the kiosk, and and you pointed out some things around temperature and not shining into the sunlight, and and um, uh, what what other um, you even talk about, Nick, traffic flow in some of these universities, right? That's another uh, consideration. Yeah, there's there's a number of logistical things that obviously people are trying to have to figure out, you know, how many people are coming through a door um, into a specific area. You know, we, we experienced um, a number of different situations in the university space where, you know, you have, uh, you know, a couple hundred hungry uh, 19 to 24 year olds trying to get into a cafeteria. Right, and so it's important to understand the logistics of being able to scan and, and truly get a measurement for everybody and what works and what fits in most of these cases. So in a small office environment, one kiosk or one device in a, in a location at an entry or a back door or something like that might be uh, sufficient. However, in some cases you may have the first shift, the third shift and the, you know, uh, they all have breaks and per the protocol based on, you know, uh, where you fall in the CDC guidelines, you may be screening people before they come to work, um, when they go on break, after they come back from lunch, um, and so on and so forth. And so keeping that in mind to be able to deploy something, whether it's very fast or very simple, uh, either way, you will have, you know, to keep those types of things in mind. One of the things that we really recognize is you know, there's, this is all timed, you know, everything is impacting everybody's day and their life. And, and um, so 
even um, unions have gone so far as to say, while you are checking people in, you must be paying them you know, during that time. And so maximizing the efficiency there is very important. And so you know, to go through a screening or go through a, a uh, process is extremely fast. As you're walking up to the device, um, it starts to recognize, you know, go through the uh, vector files, which are about 30 frames per second. So in about a 30th of a second, it's uh, screened the individual, um, a, attributed a temperature to them, and it has been logged all seamlessly and all uh, you know at the same time. So very quick, you do have to address the device um, because the device does not have any recording capabilities. So there is no ability to surveillance um, anything. So there's no recording uh, video or pictures that are actually taken. The, the camera itself is actually just scrolling through the vector files as you're approaching and addressing the device. So in some cases, from a security standpoint or from a privacy standpoint, we cannot look through a file or go back to the device and see who's walked past or who's approached the device unless you have actually um, you know, addressed it. Um, it is not going to activate the uh, vector scan. So okay. that's an important right. thing to note that there is no surveillance capabilities uh, within this um, uh, device. Thanks, thanks, Nick. The other thing just what we experienced is, is that, <clears throat> that these kiosks um, actually are run over Wi-Fi, CAT6, whatever you need to do, which is awesome. We even took a kiosk and we made it uh, battery powered and a hotspot in case you don't have Wi-Fi or power. Um, so we came up with a configuration where there's a 12 hour battery, rechargeable battery and, and a hotspot and, and you can literally put it anywhere. You can get a, uh, you know, a, a cell phone signal if, if that's what you need to do. Um, preferably you'll hook it up to your, your Wi-Fi uh, but uh, but in those cases, we got that covered as well. So we're we're kind of getting compressed on time. Um, Bailey, if you can move to the next slide, I think we've answered a lot of these questions, but let's go through this. Um, who has access to the temperature data? It's really the administrator and it's a pass fail. If you look at it, uh, it's a it's a portal. Uh, can the device work without internet? Um, Basically, it can continue to do it, uh, but uh, it will not be able to send a notification, obviously, if someone walks up to the kiosk, it'll log it if someone has a temperature. So that's definitely not optimal. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the accuracy of the product, Nick, real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the NIST report is a very, very uh, highly regarded and, and kind of the, the standard in which, you know, facial recognition um, is kind of judged and measured. Um, and we don't, there's, there is no competition to our facial recognition right now in the world. So um, that's a great piece for us to know and understand. That's given us a tremendous amount of value. The accuracy is uh, within 0.3 degrees uh, Celsius, which equates to just about uh, 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, it is important to understand that we are targeting a specific location on the individual or the subject to get that accurate reading. Okay, thanks, Nick. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, you already talked about we use the data stored. We got that part. Um, and then how is the biometric data stored? I think we we also talked about that. It's it's really encrypted, it's vectoring, it's not a picture of you and your puppy. It's uh it's literally just vectored information. Okay. So um let's move quickly to the next slide, please. And Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um and this sure. is this is going a little bit beyond the scope of this of this uh, webinar today, but but let's let's tease this a little bit. Right. So just to kind of quickly uh, demonstrate, the neat thing about this the kiosk is that can be your your good solution, just the temperature kiosk, but you can build on that. So the better you can see here, we've added uh, blue Bluetooth or BLE. Uh, 
lanyards, potentially wristbands, it can pair with ID cards. And now you've not only do you have a temperature sensing kiosk, but you've got the ability that once the person gets on prem, which again we can cover in another session, um, to help with contact tracing and congestion or occupancy monitoring. And then the very best solution is we're putting here, now that you've got all these data streams coming in, you can actually take all this all of this information and put it into your analytics platform. Well, which of course we we've found a great solution for that um, for pretty much any IoT device. And now we've got logging, we've got reporting, and we've got the ability to tie in with most of the major HR uh, solutions already out there. Yeah, so no, that was a real quick. Yeah, Sam, I appreciate that. And and again, it's critical this first part of the journey. That's why we're dedicating this whole uh, workshop today around um, talking about that because if you don't have that first mile of defense, if you will, of the journey, then you're letting students, employees come on premise with a precondition, which is not going to be good for anybody, no matter how good your solution is around contact tracing or proximity tracing, which we'll get in to uh, the next fast track uh, a webinar that we're gonna put on. But anyway, just thought we'd mention that you could really come up with a good, better best that's, that's uh, you know, you've, you find some school districts that say, I just wanna be compliant and I don't want you to boil the ocean. And we could take those rules that they have and come up with a technology solution fairly quick. And one they could leverage really using the HEROES Act and the CARES Act, there's funds available to do this. So it's really, uh, you know, a, a, a good, uh, it's, it's the perfect storm in a good way. So um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is quickly review there's two slides here. One is around um, technology solutions and non-technology solutions. So I'll go through the technology ones and Sam, you can go through the non-technology ones. So we talked about Juniper Mist uh, AI-driven wired assurance platform. Really, that's the infrastructure when you're on-prem that will do your contact tracing, proximity tracing, and what you call look back. So what happens is, what happens if you have a student or an employee that uh, you determine that is not well, okay, um, you're going to want to look back and find out when that person's been, uh, who that person's been around, and be able to do some kind of notification. Uh, and, and that's really up to what I'll call the employer or the school to do that. All that data that's on that analytics platform is really. Um, encoded data so there's no way I could tell um, who you know who the person is but that school administration can or human resources can uh, we talked about uh, kiosks um, and we talked we're going to talk about another series kind of the beacons and lanyards because those those devices that are going to figure out you know who you've been in contact with are going to vary uh, people said, well, you know, we'll just let kids use their cell phones. Well, a lot and a lot of kids, not a lot of kindergartners have cell phones. Um, and, and not a lot of neighborhoods uh, will uh, either allow them uh, to bring, have their kids bring them to school or <laughs> can they afford them? So you have to have a variety of devices that, to choose from so that the proper uh, contact tracing can be done. And then the key of this whole thing, the platform, really ties back to point number one. When you look at this whole Juniper Mist solution and this whole AI-driven wired assurance platform, you know, that includes access points, BLE devices, BLE beacons, um, uh, all the all the uh, you know networking gear that goes around that, and all the analytics that are part of that. Again, these are Juniper Mist analytics. It's an amazing package. So next slide. So why don't you go over Sam some of the non-technology solutions that are just equally as important? Right. So as we were going along through this process, 
we realized you still need to address a ton of non-technology solutions. And, and as Brian said, they're just as important as the technology-based solutions. And as you can see here, I mean, signs and placards giving folks directions on, um, you know, safety measures, what they should be doing and safe distancing and, uh, you know, touchless hand cleaners and personal protective devices. So as folks walk in, maybe giving them the ability to use some apparel and, and grab a face mask, for example. And then even you can see on item number three, even physical layout. And again, this kind of gets into the on-prem piece, but we, with this, these analytics, you can actually look at, at uh, movement and you can look at areas that do become congested and then you can make this decisions on, you know, maybe we reroute the way the furniture goes, or uh, maybe you can divide a conference room in half or stagger shifts, et cetera. So, it just gives us a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of non-technology pieces here um, that are part of the, the, the full solution. And then finally, four, probably one of the most important, as we discussed right at the very beginning, all of this we have to do, we have to protect personal data. Uh, we have to make sure that if we get, if, if we do get any HIPAA data, that we control that and we have to deal with any regulatory compliance. And um, I don't know if anybody's been following it, but but I've actually been following it quite closely. And on the regulatory compliance piece, it seems like it changes almost weekly. It's a moving target. So yeah. and again, it's it's applicable to state, city, and local. Uh, you, you know, so wherever wherever you may be, it, it, it's it's a challenge. So. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Next slide, Bailey. Sorry, I'm going through these quickly. Probably just build this one out if you like. I'll uh, I'll go through this. This is kind of what we did in our office. You know, we put up the signage that Sam recommended. We have in the lower uh, right hand corner the PPE. We even had the manual thermometer there. Uh, we had to relay out the office as well physically to make sure chairs in the conference room there weren't more. You know that people could be six feet apart, so on and so forth, and and you know all the hand sanitizers and so it's it, it's quite involved next slide please here's a, a you know these are not glam photos uh but these are it's just a picture of the kiosk and we have a standalone kiosk sitting at one of our doors that uh you walk up and um and the firmware i mean the, the software has been changed a little bit it, it will say you have a healthy temperature. It won't exactly say what that temperature is. That's one of the changes that we made with the Pop ID folks. Uh, but uh, it's that simple. Next slide. And then, um, uh, Sam, do you want to really quickly go through this because we we don't have time to cover this. Yep. And I'll, I'll jump in and go through this super quick. So, in the what we with the solution, we're also you don't have to do this on your own. Um, if you need some help or you want to engage us, that's what we're here for. So we've got the entire process from evaluating a customer's current state, uh, identifying what they have left to to, to accomplish, um, to even creating a biosecurity program, which is really a plan. Uh, and then again, dealing with any regulatory compliance issues specific to that customer, we can help you with that. And then, of course, designing and implementing the solution um, all the way to providing support, monitoring, and alerting. So, uh, you know, from beginning to end, any piece of this that you need help with, uh, we're here. We're we're here to help. Thanks, Sam. Well, this was our exact approach. Uh, next slide. Okay. So, really, the questions being asked of all of us is. And, and there's there's some cases that are different than others, but it's really around, like we talked about, the proximity tracing, the congestion hot zone, too many people in the room, um, really what I'll call self-evaluation instead of pol policing, or I think that says policing. Um, social distancing, that, that's something that is non-technical, that uh, is could be monitored by technology. Talked about entry testing and um, you know what tech do do we need? That's really what's coming at us. All these pieces, 
and that's why we put together this solution. Um, next. So, um, Sam, do you want to go over this one real quick? Sure. Again, this is going to be covered more in depth in another series, but this is really on-prem use cases um, and, and what the, the journey user, the, the user journey map is, again, talking about creating zones on-site, on-prem, where um, employees have actually declared or been found to have COVID-19. Um, you know, then you can apply proximity tracing and you can basically figure out who's been in contact with who. And then, of course, the congestion notification piece is, is that too many folks in, in, in one spot to alert someone that you've got an area that's, that's just, there's just too many people and you're, you're breaking your policy there. So, okay. super quick and, and I know we'll, we'll go over that more in depth in another yeah. series. Yeah, a little bit of a teaser. Next slide. And I just, again, I've said a lot of this. We're just have an awesome platform to do all this with Juniper Mist, and we're gonna go into this in a lot of detail in our next, next fast track. Um, so here are all the elements. Again, just we're gonna go through this, so let's skip on to the next one. Please join that series because, uh, again, these are, the future series that we're going to have um, we're going to provide dates very shortly <clears throat> we're going to squeeze a lot of these in before the holidays hit in december so um we're going to go into the whole uh, juniper mist aps and the, uh, the ble devices the premium analytics are amazing that's what makes everything work even the look back piece of it um some of the uh, re you know the regulatory compliance and human resource concerns we're going to discuss that and this whole IOB concept that we we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So with that, um, we're going to open it up. I apologize, there's only eight minutes left. Um, Billy, how do we open up for uh, questions? If you have any questions, please submit them to the chat box or the question box. And I did have one come in. That is, how is the kiosk protected against malicious intent? Nick? Is Nick there? Sorry, I had to unmute again. Um, yeah, so from malicious con uh, intent, so um, the screen itself is actually locked down. So you cannot uh, do anything uh, to access anything on the screen itself. Uh, it's completely locked down. The um, device itself is obviously uh, a piece of technology that will be exposed or out there. We have had situations where we have built um, simple barriers around uh, the kiosk uh, to allow or to prevent um, anybody with, you know, coming from smashing or breaking it off the wall. But um, it is attached to the wall or other uh, things through security screws. Um, so it can't be stolen off the wall just by unscrewing it or something of that nature. And again, the kiosk itself, uh, the screen is locked down, so you have no access into anything. And Nick, if it's stolen, let's say someone brings it back to their apartment, what could they do with it? Nothing. Yeah. It, the screen is locked. So uh, once the app is downloaded onto the uh, device itself, um, you can't do anything with it. Okay. All right. That's good. Billy, any other questions? Do you have any customer testimonials or use cases that you can send out? Oh, yeah. Nick. This is right up your alley. We should spend a whole hour on this. Why don't you talk a little bit about, I mean, from a university perspective, just a couple of minutes, because we yeah. have literally two hours on this one. Yeah, the um, the university space has been tremendous amount of success there. From protecting the athletes um, who are requiring a, a, an extra sense of care and, and, and attention there to um, deploying out through a, a number of different universities, um, and I can mention some who have uh, already um, been out there, Ole Miss, um, uh, Bismarck State, uh, a bunch of them in California that people know of, um, uh, 
the Redlands, um, St. Augustine's, uh, the list goes on. There's probably 50 to 60 already that have deployed and probably another 25 to 30 that have ordered and, and will be, uh, be putting online um, ASAP. So um, the others are large healthcare facilities. Many of you know um, the City of Hope which is one of the most renowned um, cancer research facilities in, in the country. Um, so, you know, those types of places are, are great, uh, you know, uh, people for us to be able to reference. Um, large uh, hospitality places like the Hyatt, the Hilton, um, names like that um, most definitely have, have already deployed. Uh, San Francisco Zoo, I mean, the list goes on. So you name the market and the use case, um, we've probably um, been there and, and done that. So yes, a number of them. Um, yeah, on our, what's that? Well, I was gonna say, Nick, the other thing we're willing to do uh, is that I know we have some end users on the phone here as well as partners, but we're absolutely willing to co-host uh, an event, uh, a webinar uh, with your end customers, if you're a VAR, uh, to, uh, to really kind of go through these solutions. So my uh, request is that you contact your Securematics rep and we'll work with you to do that. And it's really free of charge. To do that, uh, we we really feel like not only are we selling technology, but we're providing a service to a market, and we're all fortunate enough to be in an industry where we're all, for the most part, still working and productive. So we feel like it's uh, part of our duty to do that. And while uh, any other questions, because I want to mention the promo before it's uh, our Q4 sales promo. Anything else, Bailey? Yeah, one more. What level of security is needed from being attacked from the network? What level of security is needed to be attacked? So it, it's kind of a general question, but here's the way I would answer it, is that if you look at Juniper's whole uh, Juniper Mist solution and the whole AI-driven experience, so AI is artificial intelligence. AI is important because it really gets you know devices to self-heal. We've all been in a situation where we've lost connectivity or you know have weak connectivity, and we have to call our IT department. Basically, what Juniper Mist platform gives you is that ability for you know that solution to self-heal, so you don't have to do that, um, and and it tracks really your um, you know your personal journey there. Um, and all the security built around that. Again, we're talking about solutions that are enterprise grade solutions that the Fortune 10 run on. I'm not kidding. So any, um, if, if you use a cell phone or use a social media platform recently, these are all solutions that, uh, these are all platforms that currently use deploy Juniper Mist solutions, okay? So all that's been vetted out, you could feel very confident about that uh, or else those top Fortune 10 companies would not use these solutions. Any other questions? Billy, can we throw up the- No, uh, no questions. Uh, yep. Can we throw up the- so unrelated to this, Securematics has for its partners a kind of a Q4, if you will, sales contest um, going on. And if you could throw up the, whoop, I lost you. Maybe you're throwing it up right now. Hopefully you're not throwing it up, but putting it up. So a little background, um, every good company, I think, really should give back to their communities. And Securematics has really been centered around over the years of giving back through music programs for underserved communities. So one of the couple of ways we do that is we support the uh, NAM community, which is Music Cares as well. Uh, and we've also done uh, things with um, the John Lennon Educational Tour Bus. It's actually a physical recording studio founded by Yoko Ono, John Lennon's wife, to bring to underserved communities to be able to teach kids who've never even held an instrument, you know, the power of focusing on something like music or spoken word 
And we've been very successful in doing that. But with the passing of Eddie Van Halen, we felt like, you know, Eddie was a great technical innovator, which a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, not only was he in an underserved community when he grew up, he had to literally take guitar pieces and put them together so that he can actually create a sound because he couldn't afford amplifiers and effects pedals and everything like that. So we felt in honor of um, Eddie's passing as a great innovator and artist that we're going to create a sales promotion for our resellers that we're going to give away three of Eddie's signature guitars. Now, they're not Eddie's actual ones. They're ones from his company that sells these. They're, they're replicas, but they're very well-made under Eddie's supervision replicas. So you'll be seeing this. There's also a PDF attached. You can get more information. Very excited, very honored to bring this to you, and, and good luck with that one. Um, so we've run out of time. I want to thank Nick. I want to thank Sam. I want to thank everyone else who is on standby here to talk. Um, if you are interested in, well, two things. Number one, please look out for the next fast track where we really focus on what you do on prem in the building, uh, if you will. Uh, that's going to be a really dynamite uh, webinar. Lots of information. Uh, and uh, also contact your Securematics rep if you really like to have us do one of these for your end customers. Uh, we're more than happy to do it. So again, thanks again. Have a good day. Stay safe. And looking forward to talking to, with you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.